Hello and welcome to Film School Podcast, episode 10, this Wednesday, the 16th of September, 2020. My name's Adam, and today I'm joined by the film guru himself, Josh. J. Luke, how you doing, Josh? I'm doing really well, thanks, Adam. Second time's the charm. Emily. Uh, Pratt, how you doing, Emily? I'm well, thank you, Adam. <laughs> and last but not least, we have the rom-com expert... <laughs> Chris Veggie, oh man, we're off to a terrible start. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm really well, mate, and I'm just loving the professionalism of this podcast. Joel's thrown me off. We have a special guest today. We have Joel Dusha from Sands Pants. Joel, tell us a bit more about yourself. Hey, how's it going? Thank you so much for having me. Again, uh, great professionalism. It's great to finally work with people that understand just, you know, getting the job done. Yeah. Knocking an intro out of the park. Yeah, it's, uh, I love how I love how even on the second one he failed to acknowledge he was a human. He still said last but not least, Chris. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. If you haven't listened to Film School podcast before, we're a podcast where we talk about all the movies that we've been watching throughout the week, and then we jump into a movie of the week. The movie of the week this week is Donnie Darko. You can follow us all uh, at our different letterboxed usernames. Uh, you can follow myself, King Frogby. Uh, you can follow Josh at J Luke, Emily, Emily Pratt, Chris at Chris Birchy, and Joel, what's yours? Mine's just, uh, actually, great question. You look, it <laughs> might, my name's associated with it. You can just search me at Joel Dusha, D U S C H E R. It pops up. And He's look, basically the king of letterboxed, so you'll uh, find it easy. <laughs> Absolutely. That's and we will add the description, uh, the details in the description below. Um, Take it, Joel. You deserve it. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, the pressure of my next review after that introduction, it's going to be sky high. Yep, it all fell apart tonight. Uh, <laughs> all right. Kick it off for us, Josh. What have you been watching? Uh, this week I watched Pretending I'm Superman, the Tony Hawk video game story. It is a 2020 documentary uh, directed by Ludwig Gurr. It takes a look at the Tony Hawk video game series from inception to now, told through lovingly nostalgic eyes of all those who have been involved and influenced by the games. Now, I don't know about anyone here, but I was a massive Tony Hawk fan. Well, I actually do know about a couple of the people here, but... <laughs> The Tony Hawk video game series influenced both my music taste and the fact that I stepped on a skateboard a few times when I was young and could not do a thing. I could barely move forward. But I know pretty much the whole roster of tricks that both exist and don't exist now, thanks to these games. And just watching this movie that's so loving, it's so earnest. Tony Hawk is just the coolest dude ever and... Yeah, I had a really great time here, and they timed this really well with the remaster of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. So was this only just released this year? Sorry, I missed that part. I think it was released a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, it um, <clears throat> it came out just before the game, about a month ago, I think, Josh. Yeah. And wh so who did you guys used to use when you played Tony Hawk? I'll start with that. Uh, Adam, who was your I skater? Was so boring and just went... That Tony Hawk. <laughs> Joel, who we got? Uh, I was a big Chad Muska guy. Oh, that's my boy, Chad Muska. And the funniest part about this whole documentary is unrecognizable Chad Muska. Oh, have you played the newest game? Joel? I have not yet. I yeah. was almost going to buy it with this one. So uh, just on the fact that Chad Muska is unrecognizable, the remakes of the most recent games took the pro skaters and upscaled them to what they look like now. So all of the characters are in their <laughs> 40s and 50s. It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, the best part about that in terms of this is you have this massive bit about Tony Hawk landing a 900 for the first time. And then by the end of the movie, he's like 53 and he just pops one out like it's nothing. <laughs> I will say one more thing about this. I thought Bob Burnquist was the saltiest guy I've ever seen in this film. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I didn't really want to be on the game to start with. It's felt like a sellout to me. But then I got on it because all these really guys I respected hopped on it. And then the second one was really good. But then it started getting gimmicky after that. And I'm like, did you want this to be called Bob Burnquist Pro Skater? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's all I got for this one. I really enjoyed it. I gave this one four stars, I believe. Wow, that's pretty high. It was a nostalgic gem. 
Cool. Well, um, I have nothing to add to your conversation on that because I was not really a Tony Hawk player back in the day. Um, but, yeah, I watched The Nice Guys this week, which was a movie from 2016, which I'd never actually heard about until I saw it pop up on Netflix. Um, it's directed by Shane Black, who has also directed Iron Man 3 and also the 2018 version of Predator as well. Um, and in, I didn't know this. He also wrote Lethal Weapon 2, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, the movie itself is classified as an action comedy and it stars Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, who actually have surprisingly good chemistry. Um, it's set in 1970s Los Angeles and you have the gods playing a detective and Russ playing the muscle. And, yeah, they're basically this mismatched pair that team up to investigate the alleged suicide of a female porn star. And then in doing so, they stumble upon a bit of a conspiracy which they then become entangled in. And, yeah, overall, I found this film really fun there were quite a few comedic moments which i really enjoyed and found really funny um and i thought that yeah ryan gosling and russell crowe really good chemistry really good pairing and their actual performances i thought were quite good as well like i think they were on par i i didn't find at least that like one ouch on the other or anything like that um and yeah i also was a really big fan of the soundtrack like late 70s so there's a lot of 70s bangers in there that I really enjoyed listening to. And yeah, overall, definitely would recommend, like not the best movie in the world, but also far from the worst. Um, interesting that it actually didn't really make that much money at box office. Um, it made 62.8 mil against a production budget of 50 million. So yeah, not, not a huge, um, huge profit on that one. But yeah, overall, pretty nice time. Pretty good to watch. Definitely a funny movie, uh, Emily. Like, in, I think you forgot to mention Ryan Gosling's catchphrase every, you know, time uh, he gets scared every few seconds. Was yep. that yeah, <laughs> high pitch squeals. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, quite amazing. <laughs> I felt like the Goz and Russ may have actually been friends on the set of this one, because mm. I'm pretty sure the Goz didn't have a great time with Harrison Ford on Blade Runner, and who could? Harrison Ford just seems like the biggest dick these days <laughs> but these two definitely carried this movie it was predictable in parts especially near the end but their chemistry sort of held up all the way through and yeah loved it hmm. so yeah worth checking out just moving along i guess um this week i watched gemini man so the 2019 uh ang lee directed film uh, i actually didn't realize that ang lee has done like broke back mountain um and like the original Hulk and a few of those other sorts of weird films, even like Life of Pi. Um, so this is a film starring uh, Will Smith with supporting cast Mary Elizabeth Winstead and uh, Benedict Wong. Uh, this is the most generic movie I've ever seen. Uh, it <laughs> is an agent getting hunted by an agent when he used to work for like the same CIA. And it's, it's essentially just Will Smith playing Will Smith. And getting chased down by Will Smith. Uh, I bought the Blu-ray for this film uh, because Ooh. it was. Uh, it comes in a like the reason I even decided to watch this film was because it was filmed in a really high frame rate, and the Blu-ray copy uh, is shot in 4K 60 frames per second. Um, and it didn't like like it visually. It was quite pretty. Uh, I think that the issue I had with it is with that really smooth motion, you get like that really weird depth of field issue. And you can, I don't know if it was like overplayed, but every time like a CG scene came on, it looked awful. It looked like worse than like most computer action scenes. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess like they boast the fact that they were able to render Will Smith as like a young person. And, they decided to do that in lots of like really dark hallways and really dark like surroundings. And yeah, he looks great in those scenes, but anytime he's in light or he's moving through a car, like moving at, at the same time, they're trying to do like that facial capture. It's awful. It's awful. Um, this is probably one of those ones I can recommend skipping. <laughs> and definitely, definitely, definitely skip this movie. Yeah. And definitely it's... don't buy it. It's so weird that they chose to, well, Ang Lee chose to film this at a higher frame rate because uh, The Hobbit is the other big movie that was filmed at a higher frame rate. Mm. And almost every single critic was like, 
yeah, weird choice, because making movies move too quick makes them look really unnatural, so the special effects look like dog shit. Uh, so then with Ang Lee, who loves his special effects, to do exactly the same thing, uh, Brave, surprising it didn't turn out well. <laughs> I feel like when Will Smith got the script for this, he just popped the biggest stiffy, because he was like, <laughs> you mean, it's a movie about me, and me, I'm all in. And because, I don't know if you know about Will Smith, but he uh, turned down Django Unchained because the role wasn't big enough. He, he didn't also feel te- like Django was a big enough character. And The Matrix, I assume you're about to say. Yeah, that's the one I'm trying to jump into. Yeah, no, it's not all about me. <laughs> and, and, like, that's the funny thing about this film as well. Like, all the side characters, which I would say are, are, are great side characters, but their only role in the entire, like, film is for Will Smith to go up to them and explain what he's doing. That's it. There's no, like, That's they it. don't provide any purpose. I'm the biggest action star ever, apart from younger me, who's even <laughs> cooler than I am, who's chasing me down because I'm so cool. Yep. That's this movie. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, just because of, like, the effects, like, everything's crystal clear, like, even into the horizon. Um, and that just looks really jarring when you're watching, like, lots of, like other films where they tend to like fade and blur out the background. It just, it looks really weird. It's shot weird. So, yep. Anyways, Chris, take it away. I remember thinking the same thing when I watched it. It wasn't, um, wasn't my favorite, favorite film. Um, yeah. Anyway, I watched, I decided to go back and start watching the American Pie movies. So, uh, obviously from the first one from 1999, uh, just in general, it's, just such a funny, well-paced movie. Um, lots of memorable moments, lots of lines that people know about. Um, made me laugh heaps, and I literally was singing along to the songs. There's so many 90s hits, uh, to name a few. Bit of Blink-182, bit of Third Eye Blind, um, Everclear, th- Three Doors Down, I think that one week from Bare Naked Ladies. I think that's about the only song they had, but it was it's a good one. Um, yeah, it was just so upbeat, and I loved it. Uh, the sort of plot behind it is very simple. It's literally, there's four mates, they make a pact to get laid before high school ends. So that's the whole plot line. So really basic. But what the film does really well is it gets into the character development really early and you kind of, it does it really quickly too and there's so many different characters and so much variety. So, I mean, to to highlight some of them, you've got Jim who obviously is the, the person that's bumbling in terms of sexual uh, awakening or, or trying to trying to lose his virginity and he just uh, stuffs up all the time. You've got his dad that decides to give him advice all the time, uh, including how uh, it's appropriate to masturbate and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, he obviously has an instant incident with Nadia as well. And then later in the movie, there's Michelle. So there's lots of intertwining sort of plots there. Uh, you've got Finch, Paul Finch as well, who's the sophisticated one. Um, and obviously he, uh, he has a, a shot with Stifler's mum. Uh, there's Chris Oz as well, or just Oz and Heather as another couple. Uh, there's, well, there's, there's Kevin. Um, we'll, we'll talk about Kevin later. Uh, he's, he's kind of the person at the start of the movie that causes the pact to start. And then that's about all he does. That's good. Uh, and then we've got, and then, we, then we've got, uh, yeah, Stifler, obviously, who's the, the comedy value and just uh, really silly stuff. Uh, there's the, even the Shermanator with the you know the Terminator type type thing, which is pretty funny. And I also like uh, John. I think it's John Cho. I don't know his name actually in the movie, but he's literally credited on the movie as Milf Guy Number Two, which um, which I thought was quite funny. He's the uh, Harold and Kumar um, fame person. Uh, yeah, so like I love the movie. Uh, it's definitely a good good one to watch with a few drinks. Uh, and yeah, there's just so many different characters that that make it really interesting. Uh, what do you guys all think about it? I haven't seen American Pie in quite a number of years, so I'll let everyone <laughs> else jump in on this one first. So I rewatched them at the start of this this year, I think. Um, I was going to watch all four, but for some reason just watched American Pie, American Pie 2, and The American Wedding. Um, I was surprised with how well the first one held up, minus a few things. Like, the Nadia stuff is no good, and... Um, Kevin is a real sack of shit. Uh, <laughs> it's weird because the movie, and this is like 90s movie stuff, but Kevin, I think the director and the writer is meant to be like, Kevin's the normal one. But really, oh. he's like 
gaslighting. He's like, oh, my girlfriend won't have sex with me. I'm really, really hard done by. <laughs> and yeah, like watching it with modern eyes, he's just... If I could strangle someone in that movie, it would definitely be Kevin. And look, a lot of other fellas in this make bad decisions, but God, he sucks. Yeah, he just whinges too, doesn't he? That's all it is. It's just whinging and, yeah, my life's yeah. not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> definitely agree with you there. Just quickly, what was the bit about Nadia that doesn't hold up? Oh, uh, it's just it like... It's... So, they film her getting undressed and broadcast it to the whole school. Oh, yeah, they had a knowledge as well. So, it's like... Yeah. It's, Oof. Yeah, the consent part of that is no good. But it, then... It is bad to- that can, in terms of consent, but when you watch it, you still actually don't feel bad for Jim. Like, as in, like, you don't feel angry at Jim because he's like... Because he uh, gets humiliated. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why, but just for some reason it doesn't. Normally in a movie, if that happened, I'd be like, oh, Jim, what a prick. Yeah. But for some reason in this, because of his character, you're just like, oh, it's Jim, he's, he doesn't know what he's doing. Isn't that a problem with the filmmaking, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although they make well, him likeable, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, that's what I'm saying. Isn't the yeah. fact that they're like, oh, no, you don't feel sorry for this guy because he gets humiliated too, but he did sort of cause this whole thing. Yeah. Well, and he's fully in on it. The movie does... The- <laughs> It doesn't fix the issue, but, like, Nadia is kind of cool with it after that, which is strange, but, like, they have, like, a scene with her later on where she's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not upset. So <laughs> at least that's, I guess, good. Uh, it didn't ruin her life. But, yeah, like, hey, don't be doing stuff like that, Jim, yeah. you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I forgot to talk about the second one, so if no one else has got anything to talk about the first... I, I was just going to say that, yeah, definitely, like... Back in the day, in my preppy lessons, that I beat my meat a lot to that scene with Nadia. So just move on from that. Glad we've all grown. <laughs> yeah, it definitely holds up though. Like it, I think the original two is just the best because, or the best in the series, just because it's when you do get um, introduced to all the characters and and so forth. So yeah, I definitely rated that one the highest. I think I gave it a four out of five. Um, number two, anyway. Let's go to number two. So again, the plot not very complex. So they've had their first year of college. The main group of guys return to their hometown and hire a beach house. Due to money restraints, Kevin has to get Stifler to join them. Um, and they also get a job painting the house for extra cash, which kind of falls into the plot line a bit. Again, to do with Kevin, like, that's the only thing he does in the movie. It, it's a good thing to get them all together. And then it's just Kevin again. Um, yeah. so, so I think we're all we've all worked out. Kevin's probably not the the best character, but at least he brings them together at the start. Um, yeah, and then the idea of them is to just throw parties to get girls again. So same as same as the last one, other than obviously Oz and Heather who were who were together. Uh, the probably the good part about this story is how Jim and Michelle um, kind of uh, form more of a bond uh, based on Jim's uh, lack of sexual experience and Michelle bagging him out about it. Uh, and that's a whole band camp type thing that the story takes off there. Uh, and you also have, we didn't mention this in the first, but Jim's dad, just he is hilarious in this one as well. He was hilarious in the first, just all the all the advice he gives to Jim. Um, you would be very, very uh, awkward and feel weird if your father was talking to you like uh, he talks to Jim. But it is really funny and he's definitely uh, a staple character of the, of the uh, franchise. Uh, yeah, music again is awesome. Same sort of stuff, but a Sum 41, Blink-182 and so forth. And yeah, that was my review of that one. Just slightly lower than the first, but it still, you could watch it as a standalone. Like, it's better if you watch the first one, but this second one you could watch as a standalone. When you get further on in the series, I wouldn't do that. But number one and two are, are definitely the best. So yeah, four for the first and a three and a half for the second. I'm uh, going to say this in terms of Kevin. Kevin made me laugh more in a about a minute long clip that I've seen than in these entire movies. And I'll segue into letting Joel tell this story because even watching this for about the tenth time last night it still cracks me up. So Joel. So just look, I just want to take one moment before we move away from American Pie 2 to focus on Kevin, a man I hate, and I cannot express that enough. <laughs> uh Jim gluing his hand to his dick in American Pie 2 is probably the funniest scene in the entire series. Yeah. And it sounds dumb. Like, things nah. like that, usually you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. The way they do it and how long the scene goes for and just the absolute panic in everything Jim does for about five minutes, <laughs> it's so funny. 
How good is the cassette, though, the VCR? He actually grabs it and because it's still glued to his hand, he's got the whatever it says, the name of the porno on it. <laughs> he's, like, oh, he's waving it. Uh, it made me laugh. He tries to open a door with his mouth as well because he can't yeah. use his hand. It rolls. Anyway, it's the best scene in the movie. Uh, now, Kevin. So I rewatched these movies towards the start of the year and uh, Kevin really got under my skin to the point where I was telling my friends about how much I hate this man. Uh, so I'd rewatch it just before my birthday. So my birthday rolls around and two of my friends also from the Sans Pants podcast network uh, are like, happy birthday, Joel. We uh, collectively put our heads together and we got you what we think is the best gift. And they sent me a link to a cameo recorded by uh, Thomas. I can't remember his last name because that shows how little respect I have for this man. But the actor who plays Kevin. Um, and they had told him that I got into comedy because of his role in American Pie and that I really look up to him. So this guy is like overwhelmed, uh, telling like giving this cameo about how like I've inspired him. And he's like legitimately so happy, and it comes across as like kind of smug as well. So it makes the video even more unbearable. So yeah, basically I've got a video of Kevin saying happy birthday and that it's really cool that he's my idol, and uh, <laughs> he's glad that I loved American Pie and his role so much. That's yeah. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> and he so. also tries to shout out that he's Ned Kelly's descendant. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, which, as far as I know, is not common knowledge. He just drops the fact that he's, like, technically part Australian or something and is related to Ned Kelly. Yeah, he's just like, my my grandparents were born in Perth. He saw a yeah. moment to brag and he took it. <laughs> That's very Kevin. He, yeah. I think he's really living the character. Um, mm. He does look, I will give him the fact that it's been 20 years since American Pie and he still looks basically exactly the same minus longer hair and a mustache, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, hey, at least he's aging pretty well. Yeah, I'll still take Alex Winter on that note, seeing as... Oh, yeah, looks I exactly honestly, the same. I honestly think they digitally aged him for the latest film, because they're like, look, this doesn't work. You're the same guy. <laughs> anyway, I also watched... Hashtag Alive this week, which is a 2020 South Korean zombie movie directed by Il Cho. Um, I don't know about anyone else here, but South Korea pretty much has the zombie movie on lock. Train to Busan, which I know a few of us have seen, is my favorite zombie movie of all time. Uh, this one is not quite as good as that. It follows a young Twitch streamer who's stuck inside his apartment when his whole town is seemingly overrun by zombies. Uh, it's... For some reason, Netflix automatically has this as a dub. I change it to a subtitled English straight away just because I didn't feel like there was any need. Um, I don't really want to say much about the plot because it's fairly generic in terms of we have a survivor, he eventually finds someone else, it goes through some predictable story beats, but it sort of gets the human element right, the same as I think Train to Busan did. And I don't know, I gave it a three and a half. It's interesting to see sort of pandemic virus movies during this time, and this was one of the better ones. Cool. Yeah, it came up on my uh, Netflix stream, and I was actually going to watch it tonight, but then I ran out of time, so I'll definitely Yeah, watch. it's definitely worth giving a watch. I mean, it's got the stupidest title of all time, but it sort of makes sense when you watch the movie, I guess. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well... Um, yeah, this week I seem to have really gotten around the action comedy genre because I also watched Rush Hour from 1998, um, which is, yeah, one that I remember quite well from my childhood. So it was a bit of a nostalgic watch, I suppose. Um, but yeah, directed by Brett Ratner and it stars good old Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Um, made $244 million worldwide, which I thought was quite impressive. I didn't realise it was that, um, that much of a success. Uh, but yeah, again, another movie that's centred around a mismatched pair of police officers uh, who are assigned to rescue the daughter of a Chinese diplomat who has been abducted. It's also set in Los Angeles, but during the 90s, not the 70s, like the nice guys. Um, and yeah, I think this film, yeah, so obviously has a lot of nostalgic value for me, but overall, it's just a fun film, I thought. Like, Jackie Chan is really great. He's hilarious. I find it so impressive that... He does all of his own stunts as well. Um, I think that's reason enough to kind of like check this one out again just because it's pretty impressive, a lot of the fight scenes and everything. Um, quite interesting though that like Jackie Chan 
I think there's something saying that he actually wasn't that thrilled with the movie overall um, because he kind of likes his fight scenes from Hong Kong movies because they go for a lot longer, uh, which is fair enough if that's like your that's your main strength, then yeah, it kind of makes sense. Um, and something else really interesting that I found out after I was like reading a little bit more about this movie is that Jackie Chan starring in this movie was the catalyst for Rotten Tomatoes to be created. Wow. Did anybody know that? <laughs> yeah. So the guy who founded the website is like a really big um, Jackie Chan fan. And so, yeah, he was inspired to create the website after collecting all the reviews for his Hong Kong action films um, as they were being released in the US. And then, yeah, in anticipation for Rush Hour, because that was like his first Hollywood crossover, he yeah coded the website and, yeah, got it going up and running, went live shortly before the film came out. That is That's insane. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I was like, oh, wow. How interesting. Um, but yeah, I think I gave this three and a half stars. I think it got the extra half a star out of me from, well, Jackie Chan and also Nostalgia. Um, but yeah, bit of fun. Good what fight your, scenes. What was your favorite joke? Um, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't remember any specific ones. I think I liked the end, actually, when, um, like, oh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but when they're, like, on the plane... Yeah, and Jackie Chan says something about how like oh, it's it's not easy to speak Chinese or something like that. Yeah, and then Chris Tucker's got like three words to say, but yeah, he, yeah. Like, he stuffs it up like five, six times, and he's just bagging him out. Yeah, I think it, I think it was actually in the bloopers. Now that I think about yeah, it, it bloopers, he kept yeah. stuffing up, and he, they keep had to, having to retake it. And Jackie Chan just like bagged him out for not being able to speak his language. So I thought that was funny. I thought and, you were, oh, sorry, also I thought you were gonna... sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, Jackie Chan um, singing War as well is, yeah, A+. plus. That's what, that's what I was going to say to you. I was going to see if you were going to sing the War song for us. <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't do my own rendition. I think I'll leave it to Jackie. I will try but, uh, to yeah. that I love how Chris Tucker played the exact same role in every single movie he was ever in. <laughs> he's, mm. This, he's just playing the guy from Friday as a cop. <laughs> he plays... The exact same role in the fifth element, but just as like a intergalactic announcer. It's always the same thing. He never does anything different. And for those few movies, it works. There's a lot of actors that like get big just by doing the same character over and over again. Sometimes they roll at it. Here's like a kind of controversial one. George Clooney mm -hmm. is basically the same in every movie, mm -hmm. but he's good at it. Uh, some people oh. argue Brad Pitt to me, but I just won't cop it. I'm like, no, Brad Pitt can act or... Oh, they can act. It's just they're acting as one guy. <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah. like George Clooney, the only the role that like makes me think of him dif in a different light to most of his normal roles is from Dusk Till Dawn. Do you yeah. Guys know? Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like that's one that I found him to be playing like a slightly different character. In which I, I think I like. it's just because he's swearing a bit more, but it's still Maybe. all that Clooney swag. Um, the he can't help that. is probably one where he's uh, a bit differently typecast because he's like in a failed marriage, and a sad dad, which is something he doesn't Aww. usually do. But, um, yeah. Also, George Clooney rules. I don't does. want to come across as a criticism of the big man. Uh, he rules. I'd watch him in every movie playing exactly the same character. Would you watch a bunch of seasons of ER? Oh, I've watched... Um, I've watched worse than that. I've seen seasons of Roseanne. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where we move on. I just remember <laughs> him being in um, Men Who Stare at Goats. Yeah. And I cannot think of a worse movie ever created than that one. I <laughs> my eyes were dry after the end of, at the end of that. <laughs> All right. So, uh last for me, um I watched uh the sequel uh to The Babysitter, uh Babysitter Killer Queen that just came out on Netflix. Um It was really fun. I I love the first one. I think that the, the first 20 minutes of the movie are probably the weakest parts of these movies and then it just becomes like this joyride of ridiculous uh, killing events. So uh, just, just to give you a summation of the plot, it's um, Cole is back and is getting hunted by the satanic cult again. Uh, I th the thing that I really loved about um, the sequel was at the end of the first one, like obviously the, the, the cult everyone dies um and then in the sequel I, like there's a whole new group of people uh but they also bring back everyone from the first movie and everyone has such like 
these like elaborate personalities like there's that guy who takes off his shirt in the first like 10 minutes of the first film he's back again they don't put a shirt on him the entire time he dies in an even more ridiculous way and he's also like cole's number one fan um and yeah it like it's just really quirky it was really entertaining um i think the standout scene for me uh was with the the dad um and the dad of the friend, the one he steals the car from in the first movie and then crashes into the house, uh, they have this awesome scene where they're just sitting on the couch getting high and he's lying to his wife through the phone. And it was just, like, just really well done. Um, obviously, the movie plays into, like, all the, the standard tropes. I would say that the first movie is definitely better than the, the sequel. Um, it The second one sort of lacks a bit of the heart, like... In the first one, Cole, like, you can understand that he's, like, an outsider because, like, he still has a babysitter even though he's, like, 12 years old and no one else has one and, like, the development of the character there. But in the second one, he's just, like, this old weird kid who just has, like, PTSD from the experiences of the first movie, but it's not, like, <laughs> effective. Um, but, yeah, I had a great time with it. I think that it was just a bunch of fun. Um, have you, did anyone else watch this this week? I definitely didn't, and especially seeing <laughs> said this was worse than the first one, I would be steering far away from this, and I'll tell you why. The first one isn't good. The first one has one good element of it, and guess what doesn't come back for the second one? <laughs> Samara Weaving. The only reason to watch the first one, she, and she's not back yet. She is in the second one, thank you very much. Not for, for how long? Not for long. For how long? All <laughs> not, right. not for long. So we've got a contractually obligated cameo from Samara Weaving and a whole bunch of not worth our talk. Yeah, I was going to say, based on the first one, I will not be wasting my time on the second one. If it's yeah, if it's worse than the first, then no it's, thanks. It's definitely worse than the first. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little light on on like ratings that are you know that sort of half one one and a half. So maybe maybe I'll uh, jump on board just so I can increase my lower end ratings. It's um, just yeah. it's just a fun fun time though. You know, like it's not heavy. You can put it on in the background and not really pay attention. But sort of yeah. Like again, there are better movies for that. Maybe did you I... get five? <laughs> <laughs> I gave actually this one a three because I gave the first one a three and a half. Right. Oh. I, I have a friend who I will name and shame, Tom Reed, uh, also podcast. The same Tom that was involved in the goddamn Kevin video. He gave the babysitter a five. He loves it. He's obsessed with it. He's so yeah. excited for the second one. He also has a movie podcast, so you probably shouldn't listen. Even though I'm in it, I'm going to tell you not to listen to it because clearly his opinions cannot be trusted. No, you can plug <laughs> it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, it's, but look, don't worry about it. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's he's an absolute loose cannon on Letterboxd. Um, he has nearly 35% of the movies he watched. We did the maths the other day. He's given five stars to. And he has this really convoluted five-star rating system. Makes me sick. Um, he's awkward treed on uh, Letterboxd if you want to look at his profile and just get severely disappointed. Sounds oh, that, very that, similar to Adam's Yeah, Letterboxd. I was going to say. That's, that's we have one of those ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was about to say, I actually reckon that this movie's better than uh, our movie of the week. I am. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just going oh, to put a spoiler in there right now. You are so fucking wrong <laughs> that I think I might need to start hosting the podcast. Sorry, sorry. On par, on par. Um, oh, that's no, still wrong. <laughs> At least this movie right. makes sense, you know what I mean? All right, continue. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I'm just very baffled by... Just, I don't understand oh. what it is about the babysitter, which is like, see, I've seen the first one as well. I watched it on a plane. I think I gave it three stars. I don't remember it minus like, I didn't even remember Samara Weaving was the lead actress in it. So that's where my knowledge of the movie was at. But <laughs> yeah, it seems to really attract people that are just like, this is a masterpiece. But to me, it just kind of felt like a nothing horror comedy. It feels like it's for the people who prefer the second half of From Dust Till Dawn than the first half. No. <laughs> Yeah, no just a silly decision. <laughs> hey, look, I'm sure we all like. Look, Spring Breakers is in my top four, so I can't come out swinging too hard at movies. But hey, I'm MK the Beach Bum a four and a half. So oh, mm. Beach Bum rolls. It sure does. Oh, it's so good. And Joel, right. just quickly, what did you watch this week? 
Oh, okay. So, uh, I've been getting super into Tony Hawk, like Josh put at the t- top of this episode, uh, which then has resulted in my brain being like, oh man, early 2000s media, skateboarding. Uh, so I've watched all of the CKY movies and the three Jackass films in the space of a week and a half. Uh, so <laughs> it just kind of melted my brain. <laughs> uh, did you... I'm- oh, sorry, go. I've been jumping on the Jackass movies this week too. So, um, were you, did you watch one, two, and two and a half, or was it one, two, three? Uh, so I watched. Sorry, I watched one, two, two and a half, and three. Oh, and CKY. Two and, a half. <laughs> <laughs> two and a half is real weird because one, two, and three all have like they're funny, but also like you feel like that it's just like good vibes. Yeah. But two and a half. They just like, they put all of the fights they had in on set. And the fact that Jeff, the director, was like, yeah, there was days where I couldn't shoot because everyone was just kind of so fucked that they were just, like, constantly pranking me so we couldn't (laughs) film anything. And then everyone was just in a terrible mood. And I was like, ah, this has really wrecked the vibe of the second one for me. Although, uh, look, this is... There's no nice way for me to describe this. So uh, apologies if people don't want to hear about horse semen. But uh, in in 2.5... Bam flies a kite out of his ass. He puts, he ties a kite to anal beads, puts anal beads in his ass, flies a kite at the beach. It's very funny. Uh, then, because 2.5 has like talking heads interviews. Uh, so Bam then says, it was funny, it worked, but we felt like that, you know, seeing anal beads attached to a kite flying across a beach was a bit too pornographic to put in Jackass 2. But in Jackass 2, they jerk off a horse. Like that's in the movie. Yeah, so that's like, fucked. what is the what? What it happened worked. to Bam's brain when that's worse? <laughs> what were the two thousands? Yeah, look, um, we'll recommend them though. Jackass two point five is definitely the worst of the four movies. I get why it's a DVD, basically, like a uh, it's just deleted scenes but edited together so that it's a film. Um, but yeah, there's so many funny parts from the first three Jack, well, from the three Jackass movies. Um, I couldn't even pick a favorite bit. I think Johnny Knoxville is probably still my favorite member of Jackass, though. Even though as the movies go on, he's more and more of just a host rather than a mainstay as the stunt guy. And uh, Steve-O has an incredible glow-up. It turns out when you stop taking every drug under the sun and stop drinking, uh, and you're a naturally handsome guy, your body kind of recovers and you just get handsome again. Yeah, he has a YouTube channel at the moment, I think, that he's always like posting stuff I see all over the internet all the time. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. just, just really quickly, Joel, have you seen mid nineties? I have seen mid nineties. Yeah. The skateboarding movie. I just thought that, like, yeah. that that's a pretty good skateboarding movie. If so interested. I quite liked mid nineties, uh, but I feel like that. So that's directed by Jonah Hill. Um, yep. I watched that pretty close after I just rewatched kids, which is a mid night, an actual mid nineties movie. Um, which also focused a lot on skateboarding and youth in the mid nineties, but it was made in the mid nineties. And kids goes really, really hard. It's like a really like stressful watch because so many terrible things happen. Um, so like watching mid nineties after kids made me kind of not like mid nineties as much because it felt like a watered down version of that. Okay, cool. I'm definitely check out kids and uh, look. I cannot express enough. How- it's like one of them. It's a really upsetting movie. Like it's pretty disturbing. It's um- isn't there a line in an Eminem song about that song about that movie? Uh, yeah, probably. It's, um... That's it's, how hard it is. Yeah, it's not banned anywhere, but I think it definitely has been in conversation about being banned, because it's a lot of... Actually, yeah, well, I think it was banned in Australia for a little bit, and then the follow-up by the same director was flat-out banned. It's made by the same director who made Ken Park, and it's written It's written by Harmony Corinne, who went on to go make things like Spring Breakers, Gummo, and Beach Bomb. But it's not good vibes, it's bad vibes. Very bad Hmm. Okay. Well, well lots of skateboarding, so that's fun. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. That sounds interesting. Yeah. All right. So now we jump into the movie of the week, and this. Oh, let me just. Perfect segue there. Uh, Another ten out of ten <laughs> intro there, Adam. <laughs> We're off to. A- this is such a great podcast. Um, so, uh, the movie this week is Donnie Darko, uh, released in uh, January 19th, 
twenty twenty uh, two thousand and one. <laughs> oh, my Brand God. new movie, Donnie Darko, <laughs> <laughs> directed by Richard Kelly, with a budget of four point five million and a box office of seven point five million. It stars Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Gina Malone, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and James Duval, among like heaps of others. Um, what did everyone? Uh, do you want to jump into the plot? Yeah, um, I'm surprised you couldn't even get Patrick Swayze or Drew Barrymore in there. I know, I know. We'll get into the outline. That's uh, how little Adam cares for this movie, let me just say. Uh, in my defense, I was working till 9 o'clock. I jumped straight across into the podcast. <laughs> I have had no rest in between. So That does sound like a lot of excuses to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... After narrowly escaping a bizarre incident, a troubled teenager is plagued by visions of a large bunny rabbit that manipulates him to commit a series of crimes. I think uh, Chris can take it away from here. Uh, yeah, like my my intrigue straight up with this movie and curiosity was was next level. So I was I was just trying to work out what's going on, and it's really like quite complicated. So you really need to follow on. Um, but yeah, from the start, like the plane engine going into his room. I was like, what's going on here? Then he's hearing voices, visions. Um, he ends up on the golf course talking, and a rabbit's talking to him, telling him that the world's going to end in 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes and 12 seconds. So there's all this stuff happening. You kind of, you're thinking, what's going on? Is it, is the rabbit real? Does he have schizophrenia? What's, what's the go? Uh, then, you know, a little bit later in the movie, he has conversations with his science teacher about time travel, black holes, needing a vessel, all this sort of stuff. Uh, he's... The same teacher also talks about grandma, or not grandma, death, he calls it Robert, um, uh, Roberta Sparrows, and she wrote a book called Philosophy, Philosophy of Time, which describes essentially what's happening to Donnie Darko, uh, what he's experiencing. So that sort of implies that she's had a similar sort of an experience as well. Uh, yeah, so that was like my intrigue was just, yeah, next level. Um, but yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to explain what happens or make some sort of interpretation. <laughs> But it, it could be way off, but it's I'm just putting the disclaimer out there. This is my interpretation from watching and also reading some, uh, some articles on it. So, right, deep breath. The movie has a primary universe. So I, when I was watching it, I was thinking there might have been two different universes, but when I researched it, it's a primary universe is what it's called. And there's also a tangent universe. So I was just thinking that was an alternate one, but it's called a tangent. So with the tangent universe, there's a, a limited time length of that. Hence Donnie's end of world time that he wrote in his arm and the bunny told him about the 28 days. So in the movie, I was thinking that Donnie was kind of like the chosen one uh, when I was watching it. Again, when reading, uh, it's co he's called the living receiver. So with his purpose being to save the universe or the primary universe by sending an artifact from the tangent universe to the primary universe. He he actually appears to be chosen at random too, so it's not as if he um, was always going to be this person. He's, from what I could gather, he was chosen at random, kind of like a lot of other movies you watch. It's important to note here that Donnie being called the living receiver comes with some superhuman abilities, which are hinted at in the movie or hinted throughout. The first and probably most obvious is when the axe is in the rock mascot, uh, kind of saying that he's got, you know, superhuman strength, I suppose. That's that's when he was flooding the school. Uh, it's also important to note here that it's assumed that he has the ability to do telekinesis. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of one of the things that's assumed towards the end of the movie. So, again, everything that's occurring in this tangent universe, which is pretty much 99% of the movie, like most of the movie is in the alternate universe. All the characters, including their actions, what they say, what they do, is all being built up to lead Donnie to save the primary universe. So to list a few things that could be included in this, and there's plenty of things, that would include uh, the girl that ends up being his girlfriend, Gretchen, choosing to sit next to him in the classroom, even what Drew Barrymore said, you know, pick the hottest boy in the class and sit next to. Uh, the inner tunnel that Donnie has, that he sees within people and himself, leading him to his parents' room to get the gun out. Uh, Gretchen not waking up in the cinema. His cellar door conversation with Drew Barrymore. So that ends up being an important part of the movie as well. Uh yeah, so even with Roberta Sparrow being on, like, towards the end, being on the road, and he'd sent a letter to 
uh, Donnie had sent a letter to Rob, Roberta Sparrow and that's what she had in her hand. Um, this causes the car that's driving to swerve around and then that ends up killing Gretchen by running her over. Donnie then with the gun that he got earlier ends up shooting Frank, noticing afterwards that it's the Halloween rabbit costume and putting all that together. Uh, so I'll try not to speak too much longer. Uh, so kind of at this point, I think this is roughly when Donnie kind of puts it all together himself and realising that he needs to save Gretchen to at the same time save the primary universe. So it's kind of like, I can't remember what the word is, but the um, it's kind of like a safeguard to make sure that Donnie doesn't go, well, why would I, you know, essentially kill myself? Um, you know, there's a reason for it because he wants to save the person that he loves. Now, to do this, uh, he, well, he drives to this area quite high up in the mountain. You can see one of the um, wormholes or portals that are, that's opened up. So, uh, And he uh, has all these conversations running through his head from what the science teacher was saying. So stuff like um, requiring a vessel or a portal, wormhole, most likely a spacecraft or metal craft of any kind to, um, I suppose, save the universe. And what he does through his telekinesis ability is saves, uh, so I'm really struggling with this, he gets the plane engine um, through a portal from the tangent universe into the primary universe, which essentially restores the natural order. Um, and then once he does this, you see like a bit of a time lapse in reverse of the previous 28 days, um, which signifies the balance has been restored and he's saved the primary universe. Um, then he wakes up, you see him in his bed smiling. And I'm going to let you guys talk because talk, that was a uh, long yeah. talking to me. I think we can uh, add this as a educational podcast now because you've just given <laughs> a very in-depth analysis of Donnie Darko. I think you nailed it, though, because... I spent that's... a lot of time trying to work it out, and I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping I got there. <laughs> so before we go forward, has everyone... did it, How many people hadn't seen Donnie Darko before recording this podcast? I had, I had not seen it before. All right, so I had seen it, but I didn't remember it at all. It was when I was young, and obviously, you had no idea. I just thought it was a weird rabbit movie. <laughs> yeah, hey, fair enough. I was a dipshit Dotty Darko teen who thought I was so much cooler <laughs> for having seen this like six times. So, yeah. Hey, when you if if you watched this before two thousand and nine, it was like a badge of honor that you had seen weird movies. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty much like the goth version of Fight Club. Um, but yeah, there's two versions of this. Uh, it's got one of the most famous director's cuts out of movies I can probably think of. So, uh, the director's cut adds 20 minutes to it and includes pages from the book that Donnie gets, uh, which like explain a lot of the ambiguity. I like the original version better, but I know that pretty much everyone else likes the director's cut because there's way less mystery. It's more just like, ah, oh, sweet. I understand what's going on now. So... If you're looking to have the movie explained to you by the movie, check out the director's cut. Yeah, if not, watch this podcast and <laughs> then watch the theatrical cut. Because I agree, the theatrical cut's better, and that's what I think we all watch for this one. Yeah. yeah. I actually watched the director's cut with the pages. And you still didn't get it. And you no, still no, no, didn't no, get no, it. No, no, no. I, the thing is, I, it's not that I didn't get it. It's just like, was it enjoyable? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was captivating. Yeah. I, I, like, so, yeah, I can definitely say it was beautifully shot. That thing's <laughs> fantastic. I think so, the story is overly convoluted. Hold on, hold on. And, like... i just got to introduce this because this is a section of the movie. Uh, this is a section of the podcast where Adam tells us why the movie is really good and it's this awesome movie. And then he says, oh, but it's just not that good. And it never makes any sense, but we'll give him a go this time. That's so, right, because after he speaks, he'll increase his rating too. So he'll say a three and a half and he'll speak for five minutes and he'll, he'll be like, oh, Yeah, he'll five, convince five, himself. Five, four, four and a half. <laughs> nah, so like, I would say that... <laughs> Shut up. This... <laughs> hey, Adam, before you continue, yeah, I got one sorry. question. Go for it. Do you... No, hey, uh, it's a question for you. Uh, so are you someone that doesn't like movies unless they make you feel good? Like if a movie makes you feel bad, you're like, well, that's not as good as like a happy movie. Because I can understand giving this like a three and a half if you're like, ah, it's too dour. No, not at all. Because I think, like, I rated the Joker quite highly. Um, he, gave, he gave you an out and you still didn't take it. <laughs> and then just fucking... I'm double downing. Buried 
buried me uh, with like, yeah, actually Joker rules, Donnie Darko not so much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know what you rated Joker because I know it was quite low. I think you and Josh were pretty similar in that regard. Uh, I, I think I gave it a three, but I regret that. I That's gave too it a two. Yeah, <laughs> I went real hard on it. Yeah. This is a good movie <laughs> if you want to analyse stuff. like, And if you want to sit down and read an article afterwards to explain it to you. Like, it doesn't convey, like, I don't know. It just didn't convey a good story to me. But like, here's the thing. You watch the version where you don't need to sit down and read an article <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> but I kind of did. I wanted to understand, like, every single, like, facet of the movie. And it just wasn't that enthralling. Like, I feel like there's better time travels, like, and different So you were movies. so intrigued by it that you had to know all about it. But no, nah, it wasn't that good. And we also do a podcast about it. So I, I wanted and I to read it. up. Let me let me mention this as well. You thought Dottie was a dick. Dottie rules. Yeah, I couldn't get past that. I don't like I don't understand where that's come from, Adam. He's Adam yeah. I can't stop imagining you just sitting at home being like Googling everything to do with the movie, like, uh, oh, time travel and then like how does one suck a fuck? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like like there was some great bits of comedy. I loved the bit with like fear and love and him cracking the shits at the teacher. <laughs> And I also, like, really liked when he, like, got up and yelled at the, um, what's his name? Patrick Swayze. Yeah. But, like, yeah. he is a dick, right? Why? But how he's is a, he a dick? He's definitely a moody teen. Yeah, he's a moody teen. But can can I just express how fucked up it will be to... So, everyone's telling you you're schizophrenic. You've grown up in this realm of mental illness. So, you're self-aware of it. So you're like, well, is this shit I'm seeing actually happening? And because it is, you can't not see it. You would be so fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, <laughs> Silence from Adam. Adam. Adam's just Adam's just got a letterbox. He's like, yeah, maybe this is a four. No, no, no. It's definitely <laughs> it's definitely not a four in my eyes. You guys, are, I gave it a hey, three and a half. What about what about Patrick Swayze's transformation from Dirty Dancing? To to child pedophile ring dungeon type thing was that was that a bit of a, a change? Oh, like how on the nose was that bit? Like come but, on, do you, you realise why that's fucked up as well, right? Because in the primary universe, they still don't know that he's, that he's actually a, kid, a pedo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in the true timeline, he gets away with it, which is so fucked. So Adam, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, true. I've just gone onto your letter boxed and. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this to like this is not please real, do Adam. This. Definitely, please do this. So, uh, Adam, yes. I've just like scrolled a mere like five movies down from Donnie Darko, and I noticed you gave Perks of Being a Wallflower a four, a movie that famously is about piece of shit teens, and also, in my opinion, sucks shit as a movie. <laughs> uh, so what about the characters in this, like fucking uh, Patrick being like, you can call me Patrick or you can call me nothing, and getting nothing on his graduation gown cap and just being really annoying and emma watson who famously not a great actress i know that that's kind of controversial but like she's not particularly great in this either what makes that better than donnie darko so like no, it, it, no, 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 no I'm, I'm constructing an argument because he's put me on the spot <laughs> personally yeah, being a wallflower is has... sad touching and a superb cast according to you uh, Donnie Darko, you would probably describe in the same way. You kind of did before. Yeah, yeah. I think that, like, <laughs> in terms of, like, acting as a teenager, I feel like they do it better in uh, Perks of Being a Warflower. Way more. But there's not as much... Go but the issue with Donnie is that he's, like, going through all this really weird shit. It's this, not normal. This is a movie... Like <laughs> This is a, this is a line in this movie. That is, Seth Rogen makes his film debut in this, and his line is, "I like your boobs." Sorry. Yeah, and like, how great is that? Adam, in the perks of being a wallflower, they're obsessed with a Smiths B side. Yet when they hear "Heroes" by David Bowie, they call it the tunnel song because it reminds them of driving through a tunnel. <laughs> I'm gonna throw up, and I haven't even seen that movie. <laughs> and also. I feel like Seth Rogen, okay, so in his very early career, like, have you seen Freaks and Geeks, Adam? 
Have I seen Freaks and Geeks? No. no. Silence again. <laughs> so I, like, I don't know if Adam was a T, because there's some random things <laughs> given on this thing that just make me very was, concerned about your Emily knows me as a T. I was an oddball. Yeah. But like, like, <laughs> like yeah, I'm far into more it. into like the sad and depressed storyline compared to whatever the fuck this was. This is just like let's just make up some bullshit about time. Sad travel. and depressing. Well, let's just like put like these weird ghosts that like tell us what our future is coming out of our stomachs. You're a comic book fan, aren't you, Adam? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sure. <laughs> so, Adam, what about this is worse than? Any crossover event that Marvel or DC have done. I'm not sure which side <laughs> of comics you love. Because uh, both of them, any of the Crisis series by DC, or any time Marvel yep. do anything. A yep. uh, lot of time travel is usually involved. I mean, Captain America got shot with a time bullet in what is considered one of the best arcs in comics. So... <laughs> like, I, so yeah, great, great question. I, um... <laughs> I feel like you're the last year left in 12 Angry Men. <laughs> you, you just won't give it up. <laughs> like, have you got, have you got a son named Donnie out there who he traveled through time but just really disappointed you as a son and you just can't let it go? I, th- I think it's because, like, they try and ground it and they try and explain every <laughs> facet of, like, what's happening. Hey yeah, Adam, but they watch the one. No, but you watch the one that <laughs> deliberately does that. Well, I just clicked on the link <laughs> and watched that version, and it just happened to be the one with the book pages. <laughs> and then they didn't linger on the book pages long enough, and it took long to read, and it was a holy shit. <laughs> so, Adam, if you want one that's a little less grounded, uh, I recommend watching a film called Donnie Darko, but it's the theatrical cut. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I reckon if. I reckon Adam's the kind of person and- who would watch S. Darko and think it's like a really good <laughs> scene. There's also like, I think it, because in the, I know in the director's cut, there's like that throwaway line about uh, the fact that the drugs are placebos. Yeah. Oh, and then true. like it throws away the fact that like he's no, like, so like from that line, you can definitely like allude to the fact that like he's not like psychotic or maybe yeah. he is psychotic because the drugs aren't muffling his effects. Like there's two different, anyways, it like, I think that that threw a bit of the story <laughs> and, and like, it was just sort of like, um, just like really obtuse. I don't know. It like this movie didn't do anything. I, I have a very light fun fact about this movie that I think is very funny. So Jake Gyllenhaal wasn't the original choice to play Dotty in this. The original choice was about a 30-year-old Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> and the only reason he didn't get the role is because he vehemently ex- he demanded that he do a lisp as Donnie. He wouldn't let it go. Oh. Marky Mark thought he was such a good actor. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do Donnie Darko as a 30-year-old teenager, but I'm not doing it without a lisp. <laughs> That would have been terrible. Uh, if that Adam would have given that movie a four and a half. Let's be real. <laughs> nah, I'm not a huge fan of Mark Wahlberg. Oh my god, I... it's a Transformer! <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> fucking idiot. Um, Wahlberg did not really like Boogie Nights, which is just absurd. Look, I, like, I, like, I honestly think that I probably would have appreciated this if I watch it again. But I'm not going to do that. Like, not for a while anyways. I do have one extra part to add, and I just wanted to see what you guys thought about it. You know, the right at the end, how um, how he's back into the primary timeline and he gets uh, hit by the plane engine and obviously dies. Yep. Um, afterwards, that at the scene and everything, you see the, all the people wake up and you see that kind of like regret or that sort of um, look of shock in some of them more more in some than others. Like Patrick Swayze's character is even in more shock than others. Um, and then you see the mum, uh, Donnie's mum, and the girlfriend uh, as she's cycling by, asking what happens, and they wave, wave, and they you can sort of sense that they know each other. What? Yeah. How did you guys kind of interpret that? Uh, I always thought that they sort of dreamed their lives of the tangent universe before they woke up. Yep, I'm I'm happy with that. I w- I was yeah, trying to work out of some sort of a a dream or a lingering thought, or there's well, some connection between the two universes. Yeah, and if you look at the people who it affected as well, and I think this is actually what sealed it for me, is 
You've got Frank, the bunny rabbit guy, all shocked because he just died in his dream. Mm. You've got Patrick Swayze's character all distraught because yeah. they realize I'm a pedophile. But then you've got the Chinese girl who actually got a very nice last moment with Donnie and yeah, had a yeah. crush on him and she seems to have smiled through her dream yeah. and things like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm yeah, I'm sorry to disagree with you, Adam, and normally I do try to back you up a little bit, but uh, I'm not on the side this time. This this movie is, yeah, I, I love this movie, and I just think the more you think about it, the more you get out of it. It's, yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. Watch the theatrical version. Don't watch the extended cut by the sound of it, which or director's cut. I haven't seen it, but it sounds like it doesn't help. Uh, but, yeah, I'd like, definitely watch it. It also like just lacks consequences. The movie, which maybe is why I. Don't. Yeah, I mean the death of the main character is pretty inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like yeah. it was all. He's a... still trying. You should have seen him on the shot. It's all in a tangent universe and like a dream. So like none of it like. Except Donnie dying. Who again? Yeah, but he. It but definitely like... happened. You could you could view the movie another way where he just dies and it's all just like a figment of everyone's imagination. Like Man, yeah. it's still a good figment of everyone's imagination. It's a so, good toy. It's kind so, of like the Matrix, yeah. how everyone's stuck in you know this this world. Like you know, <laughs> so it's not real. <laughs> all right, look, we're just going to disagree on this one, and that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to all agree that Adam's wrong. And this is a real <laughs> yeah. <good> movie. That's <laughs> fine. Matrix is awesome as well. <laughs> Uh, um, does anyone have any other thoughts or is that is that a good spot? I think that's a good spot. Awesome. Uh, look, thanks so much for uh, joining us, Joel. Uh, not that I loved having you written to me, but <laughs> it's understandable. I do give Perks of Being a Warfare a higher score. Um, Joel, you do you just want to pimp out your podcast again? Yeah, so I'm part of the Sandspans Radio Podcast Network. Uh, the big podcast I hope is, uh, host is called Plumbing the Death Star. Uh, which is like a pop culture comedy podcast. I also do Thumb Cramps, which is a video game review podcast, and How Good's Footy, which is an AFL podcast. Awesome. Look, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if hey. you guys... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just... <laughs> I was going to say, hey, no problem, but then I just stopped halfway through the sentence. That was my bad, not yours. <laughs> no, hey. no, no. Blame yeah. it on, blame it on Adam. He's yeah. I just saw up his outro too. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that Adam gave Forrest Gump a five star review, and it just shocked me to my core. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched that movie. I will fight you to the death. On anyways, maybe for another time. Uh, mm. You can follow us all on Letterboxd. Uh, Josh, J. Luke, uh, Emily, Emily Pratt, Chris, Chris Birchie, and King Frogby as myself. We film this every Wednesday. We'll see you next week for our review of Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Film School Podcast.